Hello and welcome to the MIT System Design and Management Program. Oh shoot, I didn't unmute myself. <coughs> okay. Hi. Hi again. Good morning, afternoon or evening, whatever the case may be. Welcome to the MIT System Design and Management Program Systems Thinking Webinar Series. My name is Lois Slavin. I'm the Communications Director and the host for this session. It gives us great pleasure to host Doug Dory today. And with that, I will turn it over to him with just one note. There will be time for Q&A within this hour. If you have any questions, please enter them directly into the chat window and address them to everyone. I will read them aloud, and um, Professor Dory will then answer them. Also, um, the record you will be sent a link to the recording of the webinar and to the presentation slides. And with that, Professor Doug Dory. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about the maturation of uh, model-based systems engineering and uh, focus on OPM and SysML. OPM is going to be uh, ISO conceptual modeling language standard and uh, SysML is already a standard. So as engineers, we know that uh, any uh, engineering discipline has their own language in which they express themselves. So for example, mechanical engineers have machine drawings, civil engineers have floor maps, electric electronics engineers have their own set of drawings and software engineers have models such as UML. How about and what about uh, systems engineers? What language do they speak? So turns out that what is required is a graphical, maybe also textual, formal language for conveying systems, architectures, and designs in a conceptual, straightforward, and clear, and unambiguous way. Well, it turns out that systems engineers, as of a few years back, do have a couple of languages. One of them is SysML, Systems Modeling Language, which has been the standard of OMG Object Management Group since 2007. And there is also Object Process Methodology, OPM, uh, which is in the process of becoming ISO standard since 2009. And there is also a book that was published in 2002. Previous publications date back to 1995. So why do we need conceptual modeling to begin with? So there are several good reasons. One is that we want to construct a mental picture of the system uh, we are aiming to build design, architect. We want to anchor one's understanding in formalisms that can be visual and or textual. The two things are required for dual channel processing, that is, the brain processes information both visually and verbally, and if we can do it in parallel, that is even better. We want to design systems using nonverbal means, graphical, visual, convert Passive knowledge to explicit one, because many people have their knowledge, but they don't express it explicitly. And of course, we want to communicate the concept that we have in mind to others very clearly and unambiguously. One key um, concept or term for our discussion is ontology. So ontology, for our purpose, let's define it as a set of concepts for describing a domain. Domain can be industry, banking, military, healthcare, uh, and systems within this domain. This has been in use for quite a long time. We define a universal ontology as a set of concepts for describing the universe and systems within it, which is domain independent. It is not geared towards any specific domain. Therefore, it is called universal. And what we want to really do is have ontological grounding of model-based systems engineering. That is, 
we, we want to have a justification of what building blocks we are going to use in our modeling language, not just start using anything. So to this end, we will try to determine the, determine the minimal set of concepts which is required to model the universe and systems in it, and this will be our ontology, a minimal ontology that is required and sufficient to describe the universe and systems in it. And in order to do it uh, in an appealing and, and engaging way, what I'm going to do is start with a series of questions as Socrates used to do 2,500 years ago. Uh, but since it's a webinar and unfortunately I can't get your uh, immediate answers, I will just wait a while and uh, then give the answer myself. Of course, you'll be able to ask questions later on. So the first fundamental question is, what are the things that exist in the universe? What do we call them? And the answer is, objects are the things that exist or might exist. We can think of them as things that might exist or exist in fact. The next one is what are the things that happen in the universe? And the answer is that processes happen or might happen, but we have to also remember that processes cannot happen in vacuum. They, they happen to something. So the follow-up question is what are the things to which processes happen? And the answer is that processes happen to objects. The things that happen happen to the things that exist. So if this is so, what do processes do to objects? And the answer is that they transform. Processes transform objects. So next we can ask, what does it mean to transform? What does it mean for a process to transform an object? Transforming of an object by a process means one of three possible things. The process can create an object, the process can destroy or consume an object, and the process can affect an object. So creating, which is equivalent to generating and destroying, are quite straightforward. But what does affecting mean? What does it mean for a process to affect an object? So a process affects an object by changing its state. So here we introduce, in addition to objects and processes, a third term, which is state. And objects, therefore, must be stateful. In other words, they must have state. So we are talking about not just objects, but stateful objects and processes that transform them. Let's uh, shift gears for a while and ask another key question that we will need to use later on. What are the two complementary aspects from which any system can be viewed? Two important, two key aspects. So the two key aspects are structure and behavior. Structure is the static aspect. It answers the question, what is the system made of? What are the parts? How are they related? The second aspect, the complementary aspect, is the behavior. It's the dynamic aspect. It answers the question, how does the system change over time? What happens to the system and to the objects in it? In addition, there is a third aspect that is only uh, relevant to man-made system. What is it? Well, the function or the utilitarian, the subjective aspect answers the question, why is the system built? For whom? Who is the beneficiary? Who benefits from operating the system? This question uh, has meaning only in the context of man-made systems, but less, much less so in, in natural occurring systems. So, what is the basic idea behind conceptual modeling? We have the conceived reality as we, f we sense it, we engage with, with the world through our senses, senses and we conceive 
some view of the reality. We see things, we hear things. So here is an air aircraft, airplane, a bus. Here is a person feeling gas. So the airplane is modeled by a symbol, a rectangle, in which airplane or aircraft is written. A bus, similarly, is modeled by a symbol for the bus, an object. So these are two objects. The third one, however, is different. We see something happening, not just an object existing, but we see a process. What we okay, before this, let us see what the common between aircraft and buses. So aircraft is a vehicle and bus is also a vehicle. So we see that we can start to see how we can generalize things, things which is part of the conceptual modeling, generalization, specialization is an important relation, structural relation between things, be they objects or processes. <coughs> so now, looking at this process, this thing, this process is modeled by an ellipse because it's a process and not an object, and we call it gas filling, <coughs> and it's a process, and it affects as, we, as you should recall, an object. Any process must transform an object. In our case, the transformation is effect, and the gas filling affects the car. How does it affect the car? It changes its state from being empty of gasoline to being full with gasoline. And just we, as we did with objects, we can generalize gas filling as being a special case of energy replenishing process. If this was a, a, an electric car, we would charge it with electricity rather than filling gas, and that would be another kind or type of energy replenishing. So we see that there is quite an analogy between objects and processes. So just as Objects can be generalized, so can processes be generalized. <coughs> so using graphical symbols, the model expresses relations between things that are objects and processes, these are things in our model, and the relations among them. Currently the relations are simply written along the arrows, but they have, as we will see, certain better symbols. So. I'm now go going to introduce something new, which I call the object process theorem. And th this theorem states the following. Stateful objects, processes, and relations among them constitute a necessary and sufficient universal ontology. In other words, or a corollary to this, is that using stateful objects, processes, and relations among them, it is possible to model systems in various domains and at any level of complexity. So it's a pretty ambitious statement or theorem, and I want to try to prove it now with you. So there are two parts. We say that it's necessary and sufficient. So we have to show that stateful objects and processes first are necessary to specify the two system aspects. Because as we said, these are the two aspects, the structural and the procedural aspects, we need to be able to specify them. So, so specifying the structural static system aspect requires stateful objects and relations among them because we want to show what is out there, what the system is made of. In order to specify the procedural or dynamic system aspect, we need processes and relations between them and the objects that they transform. So it's necessary to have both stateful objects and processes as well as relations among them. So we have a proof of the necessity. Now we want to prove that they are sufficient. So stateful objects and processes are sufficient to specify anything in any system. Why is that correct? Anything that exists can be specified in terms of stateful objects and relations among them. Anything that happens to an object can be specified in terms of processes and relations between these processes and the object or objects that they transform. So sufficiency is also proven, and this is actually the end of the proof. 
So what we take of this is that it is enough to model any system at any level of complexity and in any domain using stateful objects and processes to transform them along with relations among them. So what are the keys to good conceptual modeling? First of all, because objects are pro and processes are key to modeling, we have to be able to tell them apart. Telling processes and objects apart is the first key uh, to good conceptual modeling. Then we want to model the objects and processes concurrently because the world is really such that, or systems are such that structure and behavior are tightly intertwined and trying to separate them does not make a lot of sense, at least not in the beginning. We want to see how the, of the structure and behavior are connected to each other. Then we want to be able to manage the complexity of systems. Systems are inherently complex, and we do this through abstraction and refinement mechanisms. Finally, uh, if possible, we want to utilize dual channel processing in order to uh, take advantage of our uh, brain processing capabilities of both graphics and text concurrently. Okay, um, several years ago, Jeff Estefan in 2008 uh, published, as part of the INCOSET task force, a survey of the leading model-based systems engineering methodologies, and this, there were six of them. You can see the list here. Two of them are from IBM, Telelogic, Rational. There is INCOSET, Object-Oriented Systems Engineering Method, Vitec, JPL State Analysis, and OPM uh, was also one of them. Uh, some of you might wonder why CSML was not surveyed, and the, the answer is that CSML is a language, but it is not a methodology, so it is not included in this uh, survey. So in OPM, in Object Process Methodology, we talk about things which are categorized into objects, stateful objects, and processes that transform the object. These are the symbols, as we've seen them. So an object is defined as a thing that exists or might exist physically or informatically. And a process is a thing that transforms one or more objects. Again, transforms means either generates or consumes or affects, changes the state of an object. So here, here is how this is expressed both graphically and textually. So processes transform objects by one option is consuming them. So here is an example of a process manufacturing which consumes raw material as it operates. And the sentence that we see at the bottom is automatically generated by software called OpCut which anyone can download for free. I'm, I'm going to give you the link soon. Okay, the second uh, way. Excuse me, please make sure you're muting yourselves. We hear a woman talking. Hopefully this will not happen again. 
so second way of transforming uh, processes by objects is creating them. So here we see manufacturing, creating the product. So, so you see another sentence was added here, manufacturing yields product. And that's the same error, except it goes from the process to the object. Whereas the previous one went from the object to the process. And the third option for processes to transform objects is by changing the state. So in this example, we have a process uh, testing which changes product from a state of being pre-tested to a, a state of being tested, and that translates to a couple of sentences, product can be pre-tested or tested, and testing the process changes <coughs> product, the object from pre-tested to tested. Again, all of these sentences are generated automatically on the fly in response to the input by the uh, modeler, by the system architect or designer. <clears throat> so, again, the two things that OPM has or deals or uses for modeling are objects and processes and all the rest are relations between things. For example, this pair of arrows are called input-output link pair from the input state pre-tested in this case to the output state tested. So I want to show you a, a, a more a realistic uh, system. We all have exp experience with uh, baggage handling and sometimes it also gets lost. So here is a model of baggage handling which is the, the main process that you see in this uh, diagram. And we see the objects revolving around it, which are the passenger, the baggage, the baggage location, which is an attribute of the baggage, the airport and the, and the airline. These are the major objects that are involved in this uh, process. So the system's function is really this main process in the system diagram, the top level diagram, which is this one. Uh, this, by the way, is the graphic user interface of, of OpCAD, the software that I mentioned. And the one, one of the uh, guidelines in the OPM methodology is to start the modeling with depicting the function of the system, what the system does to benefit one or more uh, users, beneficiaries. So in this case, it's baggage handling. Processes should end with ING to give the feeling of something happening. Uh, the beneficiary in this case is the passenger and the operand, the thing that the baggage handling operates on is the baggage. <coughs> the attribute of the baggage is the location which needs to be changed from origin, the original, the initial state, to the destination, the final state. All this is expressed textually here at the bottom with what we call object process language or OPL for short. These are the attribute values, origin and destination. This whole thing is called the object process diagram or OPD for short. And the text at the bottom is object process language or OPL, which as I said is generated automatically on the fly to interpret textually what is expressed by the modeler graphically at the, at the top. On the left, you can see a hierarchy of object process diagrams because we now that we have modeled the top level and we see what the system is all about and what its main function is, we can uh, elaborate by zooming into the baggage handling uh, and show that it is comprised of lower level uh, processes. I can show it to you later on as we go if we have time. So uh, one thing that OPM does is to unify the three aspects that we mentioned, uh, the, the functional aspect, why the system is built, what is the utility, who benefits from it, the structure of the system, what is the system made of, and the behavior of the system, the dynamic aspect, 
talking about how the system changes over time. These three aspects are expressed v modally, that is, both in graphics and equivalent text that is generated automatically, all in a single model. So we don't need to have several uh, types of diagrams. It's always object process diagrams at different levels of depth. So here is the, we, we zoom into the baggage handling, uh, which was only a single a ellipse in the previous uh, top level diagram. Here we see sub-processes of these baggage handling processes, which are origin baggage handling, destination baggage handling, baggage claiming, and lost and found baggage handling. And they are arranged from top to bottom uh, vertically in the order that they happen. So this is the timeline which is, goes from the process, from the top of the in-zoom process ellipse to its bottom. This is how uh, time can be uh, managed in, in a, a model, in an OPM model. And the, again, around we see the objects that are involved. Airport specializes into origin airport and destination airport. The airline is comprised among other things, of lost and found desk, which is engaged in the lost and found baggage handling. Uh, the baggage has a location which, in addition to being having the states of origin and destination, now we can see that it also can be aboard the aircraft or someplace else, which is not we, we don't want to have, but this happened. And this is, for example, a condition for uh, having the lost and found baggage handling sub-process uh, execute. So, we've talked about the universality of the object process ontology, or in other words, the, uh, the claim, which I hope proved, that objects, stateful objects and processes are sufficient for modeling uh, complex systems in any domain and at any level of complexity. In order to support this empirically, I want to show you something from a totally different domain, which is molecular biology. So baggage handling and molecular biology have in common the fact that they can both be modeled using stateful objects and processes. So a little digression to uh, molecular biology. We all know, know that biological systems, organisms, are highly complex. They have organs that are made of cells, and each cell has many, many thousands of biological pathways, each comprised of many uh, hundreds or thousands of biological reactions, and all this is happening in a tiny cell, which is a, a whole world in its own. And in order to, and, and the many, many thousands of researchers in, bio, in biology are trying to unravel the, the, these mechanisms. And this is what molecular biology is all about. So we have a couple of years ago, actually more than that, uh, some five years ago, we started with the idea that uh, OPM can, can be very effective in modeling biological systems and collaborating uh, with uh, Professor Mordechai Choder from the Faculty of, of Medicine and, and Judith Somek who just uh, finished graduating and has a PhD around this subject. Uh, we have uh, developed conceptual model-based systems biology approach in which we use OPM to model complex biological systems and what we did in this particular work is to look at a set of about 40 papers uh, related to the messenger RNA transcription cycle, and we modeled it very, uh, very, uh, in a very detailed level. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. 
Oh, oh, maybe I, I think I, I by mistake I clicked. Uh, ah. I clicked and I got to. <laughs> So, yeah, this is the link, that, therefore I I got, okay, I think I'm, I'm okay now. Hmm? I shouldn't click. Okay, I know what I need to do. Just go over this. Okay. So, um, in conceptual model-based systems biology, uh, uh, we start with research papers and experimental findings that we can find uh, in the literature, which most of, all of it is actually currently online, and we construct a conceptual model which looks something like this. This is one of many, could be tens or hundreds of object process diagrams that are interrelated and have the objects which are molecules of, ver of various types and sizes and comple molecular complexes such as genes and, and uh, all kinds of hormones and, and anything that is involved in these processes. And we call this the in silico computational model which represents the experimental knowledge which is gathered from natural language uh, uh, papers that are, are available online. We have the ability, which I haven't mentioned yet, to execute, to simulate the model. So we don't only look at a static model of objects and processes and relations among them. We have the ability, and this is a, a screenshot of the simulation of this particular uh, object process diagram. What we see here is that the process called deadenylation, the one at the, at the top, is currently executing and is changing uh, the states, uh, which are the brown ones, uh, of particular objects from one state to another. The next process to be pro uh, executed will be this one, and then this one, and then we will move to another. On the left, you can see some small part of the hierarchy of the object process diagrams that are part of this system. And then, <coughs> having done the simulation, executing the simulation, we can compare the outcomes of this simulation with the experimental findings that we can find in the literature. Obviously, there will be knowledge gaps because not everything is known, at, at least in the system that we have been working on. And so we, by modeling, we stumble upon knowledge gaps that we can at least determine what they are. Uh, and so we verify that the in silico computer simulations are compatible with the experimental results. And when they are not, we define knowledge gaps and what needs to be uh, done in order to close these gaps. So this is a research cycle that goes on. And the next stage is that we add new biological conjectures, one or more. Maybe one at a time is a better approach. And we uh, so, so we do some perturbation of the model according to what we think might might be the case, and again uh, execute the model and check the results experimentally in in real uh, in in vivo in vitro wet lab experiments. This is the part of the biologists in order to verify that. The result, according to the conjecture, really is in line with the findings in the, in the lab. If so, that, that is a very good indication that, that our conjecture is indeed true. In reality, what uh, our experience has been that it is not enough to have just one... Uh, it, it's a very long iterative process of refining the model further and further in order for it to meet when executed the, the findings, the biological findings. But, so it's, a, it's an interplay between the in silico and the in vivo, in vitro uh, experimentation in order to get them all in sync. So we evaluate the conjecture, we find knowledge gap, we design and do new wet lab experiments, and we iterate this until uh, we have uh, 
all, all of the facts uh, in life. And that's what, uh, there is another paper that is, has been accepted, will be published soon, uh, which is a follow-up on, on the paper that I showed you. So, as I mentioned already, OPM is, uh, has since 2009 been in the process of becoming an ISO standard. Um, so, Paris, France in 2009 was the first uh, meeting of the ISO group uh, that, in which uh, the study group was established to explore OPM for modeling standards. And then there was a meeting in Tokyo and in Florida in 2012 and in Israel in two, 2000, sorry, 2012 in Haifa, Frankfurt, Germany last year and this year, just last month, in Beijing, China, uh, the resolution was uh, to, to submit uh, the, the draft as a PAS, publicly available specification. And this is a major uh, step toward becoming an ISO standard. So it's now being voted. <laughs> okay, I have uh, mentioned CISML as, as uh, the current standard of OMG, and uh, indeed, the, a comparison of the key features of CISML and OPM is in order. So one prominent difference is the number of diagram kinds. I already mentioned that OPM has just one kind of diagram, which is object process diagram. CISML has nine types of diagrams. About half of them are structural, and the other half is procedural. <coughs> CISML is graphical, so the modality is graphics. OPM, as I uh, have shown, has graphics and text modalities, it's, so it's bimodal. The theoretical foundation of CISML is UML. In fact, CISML is defined as a profile of UML with some extensions. And OPM is built on the foundations that I discussed earlier, which is a minimal universal ontology of stateful objects and processes that transform them. Uh, however, we uh, felt that it might be valuable to uh, look for synergies and value of combining OPM and CML, and CISML. So, uh, in a work done in, uh, and published in 2011 in Systems Engineering Journal, uh, we developed an algorithm and supporting software to implement conversion or generation of CISML views of the different diagram types from the single OPM model. And we evaluated the results through an experiment with students, 78 students, to test the quality of the automatically generated diagrams, the CISML diagrams, and how they impact the comprehension of the systems that are modeled with them. So the result, which I will elaborate soon, is that the addition of certain auto-generated CISML views to the OPM system model increased the comprehension of the system by the students. There is a challenge of mapping uh, OPM to CISML because the mapping is one to many. So as a prominent example, a process in OPM can be mapped in CISML to a use case, in a use case diagram to an operation of a block in a block definition diagram to action in an activity diagram, the state transition trigger or activity inside the state in state machine diagram or as a message in a sequence diagram. So all these concepts are actually some variation of a process with nuances. And, and the, indeed, the challenge is to make this uh, tr transition to make sense as much as possible. So, so we did this. And here is a couple of examples. This is an uh, object process diagram of some level at the ABS breaking system, which is in-zoomed and we uh, want to show a use case example. So this is what we get, we get from the conversion. Here is the driver, which is here too. And there is a ABS braking uh, use case, which includes the braking, the boosting, and so on, which you can see here. Here is an example of a 
converting another uh, object process diagram from the same system to an activity diagram. This is the resulting activity diagram. Again, you can see signal converting is a sub-process here. It is here. And signal processing is here, and so on. Here you have a decision point, which is equivalent to what is happening here. Uh, and finally, an example of a state machine from another OPD. We have states of an order, which is ordered, paid, and supplied. And you can see here the order is ordered, paid, and supplied. So this is the focus on states. So obviously, it has only states and some uh, processes on the transitions. Um, so the evaluation of our experiment with the 78 students, what we examined is the comprehension of the system modeled in OPM with and without the addition of the automatically generated systemal diagrams. And we also wanted to find whether there were any errors and inconsistency because this was the first time that we used this uh, conversion uh, system. So we used two uh, systems, divided the students into two groups. There was a dishwasher system and a city scanner, and you can see how the layout of the experiment was. One group got OPM only of the dishwasher and OPM plus system mail uh, of the city scanner and vice versa. And this cancelled all uh, any possible biases and learning uh, that, that might uh, interfere with the results. We asked them eight comprehension questions, and, and, to, and we also asked them to find errors and inconsistencies among the different diagrams. And here you can see the results, which clearly and uh, unambiguously, uh, in, in a significant way, show that there is an improvement between the scores for those who use the OPM only model and those who got the enhancement with the SysML uh, model, uh, the SysML views that were automatically generated from the OPM. So no human added information to the SysML models. Still, you see that there is a pretty, uh, a very significant improvement in the scores uh, of the students who had the opportunity or were provided with the system mail interpretation of the OPM model. The, uh, the, the interpretation or, sorry, the conversion was good because we didn't find true positive errors or inconsistencies between the OPM model and the system mail models. Moreover, uh, we asked the students to say whether uh, the SysML diagrams helped them, and indeed, 74%, uh, 58 of those 78, indicated that it did help them. And we even have a breakdown by the types of diagrams. So block definition diagram was the most helpful, 46, 47%, and state machine and activity almost the same because it makes sense because they are really pretty similar, and the use case was the least helpful. Uh, <coughs> So to summarize the comparison in this study, uh, we have seen that OPM and SysML take different approaches in realizing the goal of general purpose system conceptual modeling. OPM uh, was especially good for idea generation and rapid prototyping at the early architecting and design stages, whereas SysML is more appropriate when detailed views are required, and this happens usually during later stages of the detailed design. So we see that each language has benefits and drawbacks, and neither is by all means better than the other. So there is a, a large potential for synergy in using both a language in some combination, and this, and this study can, can give uh, hints or directions as to how this should uh, be done. Okay, so I'd like to go to the more general summary and before we have the Q&A session. And so the takeouts that I would really be happy if, if you could uh, take with you are, first of all, the stateful objects, processes that transform them and relations among them. These three things constitute a universal ontology, and that means that we can use them to model uh, 
systems in a variety of domains, maybe even in any domain. And OPM uses exactly this ontology and therefore it is fit for modeling complex systems in a large variety of domains and at any level of complexity. Also, using both graphics and text, the B model presentation appeals to what we call, quote unquote, both sides of the brain, the visual channel and the verbal auditory uh, channel. Uh, they complement each other. Some people are better than others in one, and others are better in the other. So each one can find whatever is, is best, best for him and complement with the other modality. Uh, OPM is in the process of becoming ISO standard. It's got a number, 19450. CSML has been the OMG standard for systems engineering since 2007. Uh, and what we saw an indication of in the experiment is that using OPM in the early system architecting stages and CSML at later stages can, in a syn synergistic manner, improve modeling quality and the comprehension of systems. And therefore, this is something that should really be looked in uh, very seriously. Some resources, there is this book. Uh, with a link to it, and there is also a website of our Enterprise Systems Modeling Laboratory uh, where you can find papers, software to download, presentations, projects, and many other uh, things that, related to, that are related to OPM. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we have a number of questions here. The first is two-part, and it is by Sebastian, Sebastian Herzig, and the first part is, you mentioned that stateful objects, processes, and relations are sufficient and necessary to describe systems. Is there a base set of relationships, such, uh, such as um, some sort of a base vocabulary, or are these very much domain-specific? Uh, okay, thank you. This is an excellent question. So. Yes, there is a basic set of what we call fundamental structural relations and procedural relations. The structural relations that are deemed fundamental, and this is also part of the standard and is found in the book, are aggregation participation, or in, in uh, simpler words, whole part relation. Then there is the uh, generalization specialization, or the easy relation, as it is perhaps more known for. Uh, which is the relation between a general thing and a specific thing that inherits from it. And then there is a classification instantiation relation, the relation between a class of uh, things, which can be an object or a process, and instances of that thing. And exhibition characterization relation, which is the relation between a thing and its features. And features are attributes and operations that uh, characterize that thing. So these are structural relations. We also have a general relation which can be user-defined. As far as procedural relations go, we have, as you saw already, we have seen a generation or result link, which is the graphical expression of a, res a result relation, a consumption relation between an object and a process, and there is a state transition relation these are the main ones. We have also uh, conditional and event relations, but these are more advanced concepts that I didn't have time to even mention here. <clears throat> the next question from Sebastian is, can, and if so, how are constraints or generally requirements captured in OPM? Yes, OK. Again, a, a very good question. One of the really nice features about OPM is that using this uh, approach and methodology, you can start with a requirements model that is not just a bunch of textual requirements that, are, that have number and title and text, but you can, using either the uh, requirement, textual requirement document or starting right away by modeling uh, hand with hand or shoulder 
to show the width the, between the customer and the provider, to have a uh, solution neutral requirement model of what the system is supposed to be doing. And, and then that will be the basis for elaborating it by one or more options for which will be solution specific. Uh, and then, then you can also compare the uh, alternatives by various means and select the best, the best alternative and continue with detailed modeling uh, with that alternative. Okay. <clears throat> the next questions um, are from John Clark. First is a statement, function and behavior are the same thing. Second is the baggage would enter the originating airport and arrive at the destination airport, correct? And third, a human body is a non-man-made system, right? Right. Okay. So uh, even though the, the first statement is, is declared as a statement, I, I want to argue with it. I know that uh, many people confuse or mix behavior with function. Function is and behavior are not exactly the same. They are similar because most of the time function is associated with behavior. But function, at least the way I, I view it and I define it, is something that brings value to some user, to some beneficiary, whereas behavior is just a neutral concept of something changes being generated or consumed. And this is how we define the difference between function and behavior. Indeed, most of the functions uh, entail some behavior of the system, but not any behavior has a functional uh, objective. So, what was the second thing? Okay, there was, sorry, I move on to the next yeah. question. Um, the baggage would enter the originating airport and arrive at the destination airport, correct? And then the yeah, well, the the origin the origin the, the objective is to change the state of the location of the baggage from the origin airport to the destination airport. But what we really are interested in here is not just the sunny day scenario, but mostly what happens when things uh, go wrong for some reason. And we have a very detailed model of what happens to the baggage when it is uh, not routed the way it should be. Yes, sir? Um, a human body is a non-man-made system, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. No argument about it. <laughs> is, that, is that a question or...? <laughs> okay, um, what is the next question? Okay, from um, Marc Ullier, how would you handle the time aspect and description of concurrent, i.e. non-sequential processes? Okay, so as I mentioned, the timeline in an OPM diagram goes from the top of the diagram to the bottom when you look in an inside an inzoomed uh, process. And so if you want to express two or more processes or sub-processes that, that have to start concurrently, you simply uh, draw them more or less at the same height and the system, the software understands even with some leeway that they should start uh, concurrently. Okay. Next question from John Clark again. OPM is an abstraction of SysML, correct? Uh, not quite. If I, uh, I, what I've shown is that OPM is, has been, first of all, the origins of, of OPM, as I mentioned, uh, in 1993, and the first paper was published in 1995. That, that is at least a decade or more before CML or even UML were conceived. Uh, and they are, an OPM is founded on the ontological notions of stateful objects and processes that transform them. It, it comes from a different angle or, or a train of thought than CML. CML is, uh, the way that CML was conceived is to build upon the achievements of, of UML as a software modeling language and uh, tweaking it and converting it into a language that would be applicable and usable for general purpose systems rather than software systems. So it's a totally different approach. Okay. Um, from Daniel Yao, 
did you also test the students on CISML diagrams with no OPM model? Oh, that's, uh, that's exactly what my wife told me yesterday, what they should have done in this experiment. We didn't do this. This is something left to be done. Okay. Um, from um, John Clark again, is this ML, if this ML helps the understanding of OPM, why do we need OPM? What does OPM add? Okay, so OPM, uh, like I said, it is very uh, easy to learn. It's very easy to understand. Uh, you can start modeling within uh, 30 minutes of being exposed to it. Uh, whereas in SysML and UML, for that matter, you have to really spend uh, a lot of time, and the, the learning curve is, is, is long and, and much more tedious in order to start being able to produce a meaningful models. Moreover, there are very little, if any, guidelines with SysML and, and UML of what diagram to start with, when to move to another type of diagram, when to return to this, what types of diagram to use for what purposes and how they are interconnected. It's a much, it, it's a much more uh, heavy overload on, on the modeler's mind to be able to keep uh, to juggle with the different types of diagrams and, and get a clear and un, uh, uh, a, very, a clear and intact, complete picture, coherent picture of the system with uh, these many types of diagrams. With OPM, it is much easier. From Lars Olaf Kilstrom, having spent a significant amount of time both using SysML as well as ontology development, I feel that this approach has benefits. Based on works with ontology, I was wondering if you have looked at the Ideas Foundation ontology. And um, hold on, here's something else. The reason for the Ideas question is that several concepts discussed in this presentation also appear as part of the Ideas Foundation. Okay, uh, I'm not familiar with the Ideas Foundation. I'll be happy to, to look at it. And as, as you indicated, there are synergies or, or commonalities, and I guess that that would be beneficial. From um, Jose Luis uh, Fernandez, what about constraints? How do you deal with something similar to a SysML par parametric diagram? Okay. Uh, I didn't have time to mention it, but uh, you can specify quantities and constraints, again, by using uh, uh, objects with values, objects which are attributes of, of uh, other objects or processes with values, and, and uh, constrain the behavior such that only if uh, some parameter is within certain values, a process will happen. And that, that is all done using objects and stateful, stateful objects and processes and links between them. From Jim Ohm, is the, sorry, is the converter from OPM to SysML available in OPCAT? Uh, it's a separate module, but uh, we can uh, try to make it available. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it was part of a research project. Okay. and. This will be the last question. Um, there are several more, and I'd like to inform the audience that there will be a follow-up email with links to the webinar recording and the slides, as well as to Professor Dory's email. So you can feel free to contact him directly if you'd like to discuss anything you've heard here. Um, the last question is from Oswaldo Arias. Is the OPM book available in digital format? If so, on which websites? Uh, thanks for the question. This particular book, although I asked for it, at that time, a, a decade ago, it wasn't very customary, but there, there is a, hopefully the next book, well, not hopefully, I know that the next book includes, includes a digital uh, form. And when will that be coming uh, out? Hopefully in six months. Excellent. And we'll be happy to send you a link to the website where you can get a, dig a digital version um, after the book is available. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I'd like to in uh, thank Professor Dory as well.
And this, I have to say, this has been one of the more popular webinars in terms of uh, questions from the audience. It's wonderful to see people so engaged. Our next webinar will be two weeks from today. We have Mona Vernon, an SDM alum who works at Thomson Reuters, who will be speaking. The topic will be announced later this week. And with that, thank you again for attending, and uh, thank you again, Professor Thank Jordan. you very much for your attention and interest. I look forward to interacting with you. Bye-bye. Thank you.